Hello everyone, welcome to the Cyber School panel. My name is Hudson. And my name is Tim. And today we'll be studying Lesson 13, Persevering to the End. And before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather today to um, discuss this lesson about persevering to the end as we finish Second Peter. Uh, I pray that as we go through these uh, lessons that you've uh, provided for us, Lord, that we can uh, be changed and learn about our responsibilities here on earth and uh, what we need to do uh, to hasten your soon coming, Lord. Um, please be with us and send your Holy Spirit as we discuss these lessons and may these uh, lessons be a benefit not only for us, but to the listeners online. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Persevering to the end. Um, when I first read this title, it implies that there's such thing as an end. And sometimes we go through life and we kind of forget that there is an end. And we don't put that as a priority or it, it's not something that we usually think about. And usually when someone passes away or we see sudden death around us, that's when we kind of start thinking about, wait a second, there's actually a, there's a chance that it's real. I, we're not, we're, we're not going to make it maybe alive. Or, mm. And the situation of my soul becomes now more important. Right? Am I going to be faithful to the end? Yeah. So this lesson is the last one of the quarter, and it kind of incur it is kind of encouraging us to to stay firm to the end. Right. Um, and why why do we need to stay firm? One reason, as we're going to go through the lesson, is that we have a tendency to slip away. Mm -hmm. It's like a natural tendency. Absolutely. That we have to just slip away. So we have to persevere to be able to stay to the end. Amen. Uh, the opening verse in Second Peter chapter 3 and 17 and 18 says, You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also be being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and and forever. This verse is kind of giving us a, a, an insight that, you know, we can actually fall away. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. Because hmm. if that was the case, why was the need to perse persevere? Exactly, right? Yeah. It's like if, if, if you accept once, we forget that we have that tendency to, to go away. Yeah. Um, the quote right underneath, there is no Bible sanctification for those who cast a part of the truth behind them. So this is implying that there is no progress if as I receive light, I reject some of it. Mm -hmm. Because there is a tendency there as well to filter out whatever we agree with. Mm -hmm. But if there is such light that kind of reveals some darkness in our hearts, we don't like that. Yeah. You can't just pick and choose. You right? can't pick and choose. Once, yeah. You're not going to, basically what he's saying here, you're not going to grow if you pick and choose. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's a struggle for, I think, a lot of us, you know, because, yeah, you, you do want to, um, you pick what's convenient to you, and if it doesn't apply to you, or it's not convenient for you, you know, you're not, you're not really, you don't yeah. want to follow it. Yeah. Yeah. Some things are easier to accept, and when it's harder, we forget that the times that were easy, we maybe even judged judge someone else mm -hmm. why didn't they why they know I accept that you know it's so clear <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but then we forget that sometimes we ourselves don't accept some things that are are light for us mm -hmm. now on sunday proactively speeding up the pace you know there's actually the possibility of us speeding jesus coming that's amazing. That's a profound thought. It is. That we humans can actually speed up the second coming of Christ. Yeah, that's amazing. But the opposite is also true, that we can also delay mm -hmm. His coming. And delay in such a way that we can even lose our place. Mm. Isn't that a profound thought that 
wow, I can actually make it come sooner. Mm-hmm. So in, in the question, in view of that ultimate fire, what are we called to do? In 2 Peter 3, 12, it says, Looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So we can look, but we also need to haste Mm -hmm. the second coming. Looking does not really do much. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine when you're preparing for a trip or like a vacation, just looking forward to the whole year. Mm -hmm. You just sit in the couch, just wishing. (laughs) The day comes and nothing's ready. (laughs) Like there's no, you got to pack your bags, you got to... supplies ready, I mean, if you, especially if you're camping somewhere or, or can just put gas in the car and go. You know? Yeah, you it's got, not just going to happen. You got to take action. You have to do something right, to make it happen. Correct. Yeah. And we're going to see through the lesson that, you know, there's more than just looking. There's more than just waiting. Mm-hmm. Um, could you read the that f- whole yeah. note there on page 67? The note? Yeah, sure. So it says, now... Before the coming of the Son of Man, the everlasting gospel is to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Christ tells us when that day shall be ushered in. He does not say that all the world will be converted, but that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. We are not only to look for it, but to hasten the coming of the day of God. Had the church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. Those who are watching for the Lord are purifying their souls by obedience to the truth. With vigilant watching, they combine earnest working. Because they know that the Lord is at the door, their zeal is quickened to cooperate with the divine intelligences in working for the salvation of souls. Wow. Mm. So in this quote here, I see three important thoughts. Yeah. The first one is that the everlasting gospel needs to be preached everywhere. First angel's message. Yes. Right? The first, the second, the third, the fourth. Mm. Um, the gospel is to be preached to every nation kindred, tongue, and people. Mm. That's a lot. It's a lot of people. <laughs> it's a lot of people. Uh, I think the latest numbers is over 8 billion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that number is huge. It's hard to fathom. It's yeah. hard to fathom. So before Christ comes, as promised, the whole world will be enlightened. And but is the Bible doesn't say that all of them are going to be converted. Right. right. I think that's when we get caught up a little bit because we put so much effort in, in converting people instead of preaching first. Mm-hmm. We take the work of the Holy Spirit upon our own hands mm-hmm. of converting people, of trying to convince them. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be the ones convincing the people. The Holy Spirit the Holy is the Spirit. one we're convincing the people. Right. We're yeah. only the messengers. And as long as we as messengers have the Holy Spirit with us, that's all we need. Yeah. That's really helpful because I think when I'm like evangelizing or talking to people, I get really nervous because I think about like, oh, like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this person, you know. But if I think about, I'm just a messenger and the Holy Spirit is here and God is giving, pray right before and just say, God is giving the words to say. And let them not be my words, they're your words. So. And you know, a lot of times, you're not going to be able to convince them. Maybe not the first day, not the second day, first mm-hmm. month, first, first year. Mm-hmm. And you might never see the results either. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe move away, mm-hmm. you never see the person again. Years later, or maybe in heaven, you see the person, hey, you actually started that conversation with me and and it stuck with me. Yeah. And it bugged me ever since. Mm. So, yeah. it, and even happened with us, you know, we never saw ourselves where we are today. I sure didn't. <laughs> right? It, yes. And if you look back, it took some time for us to eventually come to the belief that we have. Mm-hmm. 
And that's the same expectation that we shouldn't have with everybody else. Yeah. Some are going to go faster, some are going to go slower. We just hope that a lot of them would accept mm-hmm. uh, the, the preaching. Now, the other, the third and final point here in the, in the note is, have we, had we actually done the work we're supposed to, Christ would have already come. Right. This is a very sad thought because it shows that we ourselves are not doing the work that we should do. Mm-hmm. We're not sharing as much as we sh- sharing as much as we, we want or should. Maybe we don't have the Holy Spirit that we should have. Mm-hmm. So we're lacking something. We're not. It says you had the Church of Christ done her appointed work, as God has ordained, as Lord has ordained. The whole world would before this have been warned, and Christ would have come. Mm-hmm. But instead, we're still here. So there is a reason why we're still here. It's not. It's not because God is delaying. It's, we're taking our sweet time. Yeah. Yeah. What a privilege now moving on Monday. How are each of us to hasten Christ's return? So we, we mentioned before that if we had preached, Christ wouldn't have already come. But is there something else or what's, what is that we can do to hasten Christ's return? Um, the prophecy, the promise is that if when the whole world receives the light, then the end will come. Right. Right. So Mm -hmm. that means the whole world needs to know first. Yeah. Um, We're going to go a little deeper on the reasons why God is waiting for the light to spread to the whole world. Um, But the point is that the the light needs to go everywhere. And we see this in Ecclesiastes 11, 1 or 2. It's um, a figure of a speech. Mm-hmm. Because no one is gonna throw cast bread into water. <laughs> bread into water, you, you know what happens to that? It sogs up and it's no use. Mm-hmm. But this is a, a figure of speech that when you throw something in the water, it spreads. Right? It follows the current. Mm-hmm. If you throw in a river, eventually it reaches the sea, and it goes everywhere. Uh, I didn't think about it like quite like that. That's I, I like that. And you can also see it even further. The water in the sea evaporates, creates the clouds, mm-hmm. and then it rains everywhere. Wow, beautiful. That's a beautiful metaphor. So it eventually metaphor. comes back, you know, the circle of life, mm-hmm. the, circle, the circle of the water. Mm-hmm. And this happened, I don't remember if it was John Haas, one of the, the early pioneers uh, during the reform movement in Europe, after, right after the Dark Age, um, they wanted to to exterminate right those that had believed the um, a little different from the Catholic Church at the time. Mm-hmm. So they thought, you know, we're gonna kill this this man and we're gonna get rid of it. And after a few years that he had died, they took his bones. They didn't want anybody to to see or to have a, a cemetery place where he was there. So mm. they burnt his bones and just threw in the river. Mm. Now realizing that it was a figure of speech in a way that the message just spread it everywhere. Wow, I see, yeah. The bones are not carrying the message by themselves, but it was a figure of how the message would eventually spread everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's a beautiful picture then. As long as you're spreading, that's what counts. Yeah, yeah. So the call here is to, um, I guess Ecclesiastes 11, verse 6. It says, In the morning sow the seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether it shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. So we're supposed to, like you said, sow the seed of the gospel and just spread goodness and just do good, right? That's what you're, yeah. that's basically what you're saying. We, we, we don't know for sure what's going to come back. Right. Or how much of it is going to come back. Yeah. It's like when you like plant seeds, vegetables, fruits, you're not going to get it all back. Yeah, yeah. You'll get some of it, but it's not all going to come back, yeah. but you'll get something. 
Some places we have abundance. Some places not going to have as much. Mm. Right. But and the another aspect as well of the message and how we, sh we should preach. Right in the middle of the first quote there. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. There is nothing more conv convincing than when someone has the love of God in their hearts. Because if you, if you tell people, hey, Christ is coming, let's get ready. But your life, the way you live is not in line with what you're preaching. They're going to re reject the message. Mm -hmm. They'll be resistant. They're not going to. Yeah, you, you, you're telling me you know everything. But you're not using mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's why they say you should lead by example, yeah. not with your words, right? Yeah. yeah. So you lead by example. And of course, if necessary, use you have to words. You have to use your, the mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. Yes. But nothing more than, than the Savior's love. Christ was a perfect example. He, he didn't preach as much as he did good. And that's something that we sometimes forget. We think, oh, preaching the gospel, okay, I need to go to the pulpit. I need to present sermons. I need to, to do, like, speak with everybody. Or mm -hmm. Sometimes your actions will, will show much more than your words. Yeah, and people spread the gospel in different ways. Not everyone can be a minister, like you said, and yeah. preach or whatever. It's not everyone's specialty, but some people are just better through service, you know, yeah. acts of service, kindness, deeds, and all that. So yeah. that's a good point you make. And I feel like people can be more convinced when you see a person putting their hands on, you know, helping people and doing stuff. It, it means more for them mm -hmm. than if someone's just telling them what they're doing wrong. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. We, we tend to be, get defensive. Oh, you're, you're, you're going to hell, man. You just <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. But if you don't show them the other way, uh, they say the same thing about kids, right? If, if you're always saying no, 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 no to everything, they don't know what they can do. Mm. And even in the Christian life, we always think of the no's, or of the don'ts. Mm -hmm. Don't do this, don't do that. And we forget there's so much that we can do. You feel restricted and then you, you might yeah. rebel. You might even rebel. Yes. Yeah, that's what kids yeah. do, like when yeah. you tell them no to everything. Yeah. yeah. So just leading by example is a much more effective way, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is a privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Savior. And I think we forget that that's, it's a privilege that we can hasten Christ's coming. It's like if we tell people, hey, I love the Lord, I can't wait to see Him, but you're not doing anything to, to go see Him. It's like you having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, whoever is watching, it's like, oh man, I love that person. Can't wait to be with them. But you never go travel to see them. You ne ne never do anything to, to develop, speed up the process of Develop the know. relationship. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, oh, I love them. But you never see them with a the person or similar to, to what's going on here. Hmm. And how does God describe his aim for us? What is his aim? So as a church, we should be visible. People should know about us. We have a message. How come people don't know about it? You know, it includes in Psalm 64, Thou has given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Christ wants, God wants us to have a banner. Not just one that we just occasionally show to people. Mm -hmm. It's one that's always standing high in Song of Solomon. It talks about how impressive, and he uses the word terrible, when the army is marching and has all the banners and mm -hmm. it's just everything, everybody is like ready for battle. Yeah, it's amazing to look at. You're in awe. Yeah, yeah. you can probably see in movies that they try to represent the old army uh, wars mm -hmm. you can see how much difference it is for armies that are organized they have banners they have everybody's ready mm -hmm. versus the other ones who just like whatever let's just try to get this <laughs> yeah doesn't have the same impression 
If the church will put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, withdrawing from all allegiance with the world, that is before her the dawn of a bright and glorious day. And that's the, the struggling thing that we have is we think that if we, if we kind of align with the world a little bit more, if we settle down here and there, if we comply, that we're going to be on the good side of the world. You know, that it's going to be, oh, we, we're just like them. It's not going to have the same impact. Instead, it says here the, it's going to, the church is going to be a lot more brighter, a lot more glorious if it's distinct, if it's separate. It calls more attention than if you're just like everybody else. That's a good point. You know, we have so many denominations. So many. So many. Yeah. It's confusing. It's confusing. How are you supposed to know which one to pick, which one's right, which one's wrong, right? Yeah. And if you look at their beliefs, they're somewhat similar. And none of them really stands out. Mm. The majority of them, of course. Sure. Yeah. So many people are like, well, what's the difference? I mean, it doesn't matter if I go to this one or that one. They all kind of believe the same thing anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I think that's very true. Yeah. Especially when you're starting look in your, your your past it's like you probably thought the same thing it's like so many options which which I, one should i you know? i know i definitely did i mean not that i explored too many other like churches or anything before i found this one but i mean i mean the biggest thing is like the biggest question is like why do you go to church on saturday you know like yeah. what's up with that like why is that different like every other church is going on sunday so what's up with that you know but more than just the doctrines, once again, going back to, it was the example of the, the people that I first came into contact with, like their, their characters and their personalities that really drew me in. So that's something else that they did well. They were lifting up their banner, you know, in mm -hmm. their own way. They were, um, and they spoke openly about God and the truth that they knew and everything like yeah. that. And that, to me, that was very attractive, so. Yeah. And so when, let's say, for example, we're preaching the gospel and, and we're, we're lifting the banner high up and then we find obstacles. It's like, I think it's just not progressing as much as we should. How does God, how does he do it at, in those moments? Like right at the last part of the, actually, if you can read the, the last note there, if the church will put on the robe of Christ. Okay, just read that paragraph. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It says, if the church will put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, withdrawing from all allegiance with the world, there is before her the dawn of a bright and glorious day. God's promise to her will stand fast forever. He will make her an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Truth, passing by those who despise and reject it, will triumph. Although at times apparently retarded, its progress has never been checked. When the message of God meets with opposition, he gives it additional force that it may exert greater influence. Endowed with divine energy, it will cut its way through the strongest barriers and triumph over every obstacle. Yeah, the last part you read is just yeah. amazing. Yeah. When the message of God meets the opposition, it's like when it's really hard. He gives it additional force. Yes. Yeah. And that endowed with divine energy is not, it's not human energy. Mm -mm. It's divine energy. Then it's going to just go through it to the end. Incredible. I think this is also the difficult part for us as humans. We, we talk about persevering and it's like, okay, it's me by myself. You know, I got to go through this. But it's not. If that was the case, we're doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. No chance. No chance. And Satan knows that. He knows that if we're going by ourselves, he has control over us. Mm. But if we have divine power, that Holy Spirit with us, this is it. This is it. We're never alone. We're never alone. That's the other thing, another important thing too, is we may look around us sometimes, uh, I'm kind of alone here. Not everyone agrees with me. Or it may happen even at church. If, if things are a little cold, not everyone's on fire as you are, mm -hmm. or, you know, 
things are not developing as much as we think it should. We think we're by ourselves. But we can always remember that God is standing firm with us. That when a difficulty comes, if we stay firm, that's when he's able to help us. Because if we back out and give away to it, how can he help us? Right. You know? We need that divine energy. Yeah. Strength and hope on Tuesday. What provides strength to every believing, every believer earning to carry out the mission of soul saving? What is the thing that just pushes us over the edge to start doing something? Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times we have that fear that the end is coming and we need to do something about it. But that usually lasts, doesn't last for too long. Hmm. It usually happens, let's say, for example, um, when you're speeding, right? You're, you're driving really fast and then you see a cop. It's like, okay, let's slow down. And then you slow down for maybe the next 25, 30 minutes. And then you relax a little bit more. You don't see a cops for a little bit. And it's like, okay, it's fine starts beating up again you go back yeah Yeah. and this is the thing about reacting based on fear you're always going to slow you're always going to relax when things look okay but when you do it from the love that's inside your heart it doesn't matter when it is where it is you're still going to do it you'll be consistent you'll be consistent because that source of encouragement is not from the exterior is the influence of divine power in your heart. I see. It's different when we just charge you from the external forces, like, you know, something that's outside of us. It doesn't last very long. Mm-hmm. You can see, for example, when someone is motivated by their peers, you know, they do well. You do good for a little bit, and when they're not looking, you, yeah. you kind of lose it, right? Yeah. But if it's something internal, it's something yeah. inside of you. You have that fire burning. It's a fire burning. It's a principle. It's always there. Yep. That's how you can be sustained. Yeah. And that source of fire is the love of Christ. Amen. You, know, you want to read 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15? Sure. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Yeah, so the love of Christ is the one that constrains us. But how does that happen? It's like, okay, the love of Christ constrains us. Okay. But unless you, you read, you study Christ's sacrifice for us, how much it was of a sacrifice then it starts to mean to mean something to you mm-hmm. yeah if it's not personal if you're not reading if you're not studying about it much you know i mean it yeah it's not going to mean much to you but the more time that you spend with christ the more that you abound in his love like you said the more you start to understand what the sacrifice on the cross of calvary really meant for us and then and that gives you the that gives you the ability to even though we're you know, we endure suffering in this world all the time, right? We can still be satisfied because we know that Jesus died for us and he died for all of us. He died for our sins. So rather than living for ourselves, we have something else we can live for, and that's yeah. Jesus. It's, it hits differently when we say he died for everyone instead of he died for, for me. me. Yeah, he, he would have died for any one person. He yeah. left the 99 sheep to find the yeah. one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what actually makes more more an impression mm. in our hearts. There are toils and conflicts, self denials, and secret heart trials for us all to meet and bear. There will be sorrow and tears for our sins. There will be constant struggles and watchings mingled with remorse and shame because of our deficiencies. And that's true. You know, we we sometimes take our eyes from Christ and we start looking at our deficiencies and it gets overwhelming. 
It's like, how can I be perfect? It's hard. There is no way that I can be perfect. <laughs> it's too much to work on. There's not going to be enough time for me to work on all those things. Mm. And it's true. There's not going to be enough time <laughs> if we're trying by yourself. Right, right. That's the key. That's the key. Like, your, your goal, you should be always looking to your goal. Always. As soon as you start looking to yourself. This is a lot of issues that we have nowadays is people are constantly looking to themselves. How I feel, how I think, how I, it's just all about them. Mm -hmm. Their eyes are not... What's your standard? Others. Yeah, what's yeah. your standard? Yourself? Like. Yeah. Yeah. So some can feel good and some can feel bad about themselves. Like, especially if they start comparing. Mm. It's like, oh, I'm a little... That's so dangerous. Than... Comparing yourself to others is so dangerous. Comparing yes. yourself to other people is yeah. dangerous. Yeah. It's dangerous in, in either way. If it's if you think you're better, <laughs> someone else that's that's not great. No. And also, if you think you're worse than someone else, that's not encouraging either. Mm -hmm. So you're you're going downhill no matter what. Yeah. And continues here without the power of grace upon the heart, assisting our efforts and sanctifying our labors. We shall fail of saving our own souls and of saving the souls of others. So we will fail, majorly. We're going to fail to save ourselves and other people as well. System and order are highly essential, but none should receive the impression that these will do the work without the grace and power of God operating upon their mind and heart. Heart and flesh would fail in the round of ceremonies and in the carrying out of our plans without the power of God to inspire and give courage to perform. And I believe that that's the reason why we as people have lost the power that we had in the beginning. And that's because we started operating on the exterior. Hmm. We start focusing on the actions, on, on on the ceremonies, mm. you know, on the external actions. Because then we thought, oh, we, it's okay, we, we're preaching, we're doing good things, we're coming to church and stuff. Okay. So you're saying the problem is that we're focusing too much on looking good, right? <laughs> like the externals, is that what you're saying? Part of the, part okay. of the problem, okay. yes. And we forget that without the power of grace upon the heart, we won't be able to win. We won't be able to carry out the plan mm. because our heart and flesh will fail. And we're not going to have that inward fire. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens with the Pharisees, right? At the time of Jesus, they had the exterior was, you know, basically perfect. Mm -hmm. The ceremonies all followed to the letter. Yeah. Everything was done perfectly, but they missed the mark. They're missing the spirit. The, the spirit. inner spirit. It's not they're not supposed to have the external. It's just the direction up that it takes. Is it from the outside in or is it from the inside out? Yeah. If it's coming from the inside out, it's more permanent. That makes sense. Yeah. And why is that hope so inspiring? That hope of eternity so inspiring? I'm not sure if everyone is following or reading about it. You know, everywhere in the world, there's so many, so much difficult times. Oh, yeah. We have wars everywhere. We have hunger. And we kind of take for granted. We get desensitized. Oh, there's another war. Thousands of people are dying. Oh, okay. More accidents here. Or more, more things happening here. We, we lose that connection. And I was watching the other day some of the things there happening in Ukraine and in the Russian war. And it's just sad to see mm. people from both sides perishing, like on an instant. Thousands are dying per day. And I'm, now that I became a dad, I realize how much effort it takes to raise a human being, how many sacrifices you have to make, how, my, how many nights of no sleep, <laughs> and then you look at people that are like 20, 25, 30, just dying instant. All that was a waste. 
Yeah. And we kind of, if we don't see those things or if we don't see what's really happening in the world, we get accustomed right to their comfort zones. Mm -hmm. It's like everything's going well for, for me. My family's fine. I have my job. I have food on the table. I have a shelter. It's very easy to get comfortable in what you have and not focus on yes. the problems. We're very the blessed. We're very blessed, extremely blessed as a country mm -hmm. to have everything that we need so easily. And then we forget what's going on around us. I mean, if we don't know what's going on with our neighbors. We don't know what's going on with people that are down the street. Yeah. And then we, we fail to desire heaven. Unless something bad happens to us, unless we lose a, a significant person in our life, unless something drastic happens, we're still not going to be like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't need heaven. And that's the situation of the church in the last days, the Laodicean church. Mm -hmm. Lukewarm. I'm rich. I have everything there that I need. I don't have nothing else that I desire. Everything's good. But that's the last situation we want to find ourselves in. No, because then we'd be lost, right? Yes, we're going to be lost. Yeah. Instead, we want to desire eternity. In 2 Peter 3, 13, Peter reminds us of the promise. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, where everything is good. There's no sin. There's nothing to, to worry about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we're missing that. It's, yeah. it's just a crazy thing to even think that we, we're not considering, we're not putting in priority. And who gets to experience this? Like who will be granted the salvation? It's not going to be every single person, right? It's going to be, I think it says somewhere in the Bible, it says the meek, the humble. Yes. It's the ones who make the choice, right? And not everyone has the opportunity to make the choice, but anyone that's given the light, if they don't make the choice for eternity, they could be lost. So it's, God makes us promises for, you know, mm -hmm. a better future and a better earth. He talks about it. It's talked about in Revelation 21. But it's, it's unfortunately, it's not for every single person. But um, it does say in Psalms 149, verse 4, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. God cannot wait to give us heaven. It's like, it's ready. It's... Just come take it. Just come take it. <laughs> Just come take it. <laughs> Share with as many, as many people as you want. Mm -hmm. And then just, and, and, and then I'll come. Uh, why, is it, why is it that we're so stubborn? Why is it that we're so dull? Why is it that we don't have the fire to share this with everyone that we know, right? Yeah. Why? Uh, we'll continue reading here. The note is going to give us a little bit more light of why that's the case. Mm -hmm. The meek shall inherit the earth. It was through the desire of self-exaltation that sin entered into the world. So the hint here is, has something to do with self. So, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. already went on that. Yeah. And our first parents lost the dominion over this fair earth, their kingdom. It is through self-abnegation that Christ redeems what was lost. And he says we are to overcome as he did. Through humility and self-surrender, we may become heirs with him when the meek shall inherit the earth. So many people are asking, well, why do I have to self-sacrifice? Why is it that I have to do that? Why can't I just, you know, follow what I want and still be saved? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a fair question. It's a good question, yeah. And that's the question, and that's the thing that Satan had in his mind in the beginning. But he didn't realize that in the situation that we're in as sinners, the heart is desperately wicked. And we're not, we, we, we don't know. We don't know. Either. We don't realize how wicked it is that if we're going to actually follow everything that we want to do, without God's restriction, man. Oh. That's why there's so much chaos in the world. Yes. That you've been talking about. Yes, it's men that are unrestricted. Just doing whatever they want. It's chaos. Chaos. 
In describing heaven, it's a beautiful description here. It says right at the end, there's no disappointment, no sorrow, no sin, no one who shall say, I'm sick. There's no burial trains, nor mourning, nor death, no partings, no broken hearts, but Jesus is there. Peace is there. You don't have to say bye to your friends no more. Mm. Such a beautiful, beautiful promise this is. And that's, this is why, like you said, like we should be yearning for this because there is, I mean, there are probably many moments on earth where you have, there are times when you have peace on earth, right? But like, you, you're never going to have like eternal peace on earth. Like you'll have moments and times, but then it's not going to last, right? It's, it's never going to yeah. last. But one of the most um, encouraging things for me as I, uh, first like came into the faith and stuff was the peace that I felt when I felt like when I when I realized that hey there's someone there that is promising me a better future if I if I if I do the right things if I like just deny myself every day like we said yeah um that peace is I mean you can't find it on earth <laughs> and not more than that looking at your in our past he forgives mm. that's the another way that takes out of our minds, out of our conscience, like, thank you, Lord, for forgiving all these years of sin. So many years of sin. Yes. And that's the, the way that takes out of our chest. We don't realize that we carry with us unless we give it to Him. A serious, a serious calling on Wednesday. What does Peter emphasize in his epistle? And why? So it's a serious calling, and, and Peter is focusing on a specific aspect of us getting ready for Christ's second coming. Okay. He's talking about specific things that we need to be aware of that we sometimes forget. And we say, oh, I, I believe Christ is coming. And I want him to come, but is, is that it? What happens if I'm not ready and Christ comes? Are you still saved? That's the big question. Are you still saved? And yeah, I think and, we'll, we'll and we realize that. that if we have sin with us, we're not going to be able to stand before Christ. Not because we don't want to, it's just we can't stand it. Same thing today. When... You know, when there's someone that we work with, or it doesn't have to be us, but specifically. But if there's someone in, in a group of people that you are with, that, that's always the righteous one, you know? <laughs> the one that always wants to do the right thing. It's, if you want to do the wrong thing, you don't want to be around that person. Yeah. Right? It's just like you have that feeling that it's just... You're going to be snitched on or something. <laughs> you feel guilty, I guess. You feel, feel guilty. Yeah. Even more so the guilt, right? It's like, oh man, it's such a, such a shame. Because if, if that person is there, you're going to not want to do it. <laughs> sure. And, but even worse is before God, right? The pure, purest you can ever be. Yeah. Before you, it's like, you're not going to want to be around God. That's why we're not going to be able to stand in His coming. Mm. It's not because... People don't desire per se. It's just that they can't stand it. Mm. Their desire is something else. I don't want to do the right, the right thing. I see what you're saying. That makes right? sense. That makes sense. So in 2 Peter 3, 14 says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. I mean, diligence is not something that you do one day and then that's it. It's a constant thing. Mm -hmm. That it may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. So our goal is to be in peace, without spot, clean, and blameless. It means our sins are forgiven and we have His righteousness over us. Over us. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? Again, it's by, like you said, by being diligent and working towards perfection. Yes. Jesus, you know, I think we think, you know, we think, there's no, like you said before, like, there's no way we can be perfect, right? We cannot, we cannot be perfect of ourselves. But Jesus actually, he wants us to work towards perfection. Like we're called to actually reflect his image, to be yeah. like made in his image, to literally be Christ-like, you know? Yeah. 
and it's hard it's hard for me to imagine i i cannot <laughs> imagine doing it but it's possible with um with his power and with the holy spirit and i'm sure you're going to get into it but i think i think what a lot of people also don't realize is that our characters they have to be built like here on earth like it says in the bible like we're not going to be it says that Christ, I think I read this in um, a devotional, God's Amazing Grace, um, for today's day, August 23rd. And basically it was saying, like, Christ will not mold our character when he comes, when he returns at the second advent. I don't think that's something that's well known. A lot of people, yeah. like you said, will live complacent lives. We'll, be, we'll do whatever we want. And as long as I say I'm a Christian and I believe that Jesus is real, he'll just save us. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And yeah. I think it's a little scary that people, you know, don't know that. I don't think it's well known. Maybe it is, but I don't think it is that we have to build our characters here and we need to use our probationary time that yeah. Jesus is giving us very wisely. So He's giving us time and it's up to us if we want to take it or not. Yeah. Uh, the Christian life is constantly a onward march. The last quote out for a Jesus sits as a refiner and purifier of his people. When his image is perfectly reflected in them, they are perfect and holy and prepared for translation. A great work is required of the Christian. We are exhorted to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And if you're by yourself, you won't be able to do it as, much, as hard as you try. You won't be able to. Mm -hmm. But when you have someone to copy, someone that's always with you, encouraging you and doing and encouraging you to do the right things, it becomes possible now. Exactly. If if you have bad friends, it's really hard for you to be a good friend. <laughs> but if everyone around you is a good good friends, then it's easier to become a good friends. Mm -hmm. You're shaped by the people closest to you. You're that's shaped by the say. people around you. Mm -hmm. So if you have God around you, obviously, you yeah. are going to become like Him. Amen. So that's the goal, is to have that, that patience. Because that's vital for sanctification. Um, question B, why is patience vital? Does, it, does perfection happen overnight? <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Forgiveness no. does happen overnight. Mm-hmm. But justification does not. It is a process of constantly trying to see if there's anything that needs to be cleaned. Because we are, ourselves tend to generate things that are dirty. Mm -hmm. So we have to be constantly finding ways. And another aspect of patience here is that we might not have everything clear to ourselves right away either. You know, the knowledge of Christ is a progress thing. The knowledge of the Bible is also pro progressive. You know, not going to all overnight know everything the Bible talks about, understand every aspect of it. Yeah. Even if you did, then still not, not as good as having the love of Christ in your heart. That's number one. Because that's what's going to transform us. Right. To know something is different than to believe it and to take it to heart. Could I go ahead read some of these verses here? Um, so I think, what is Vita Maul? 2 Peter 3, 15 mm -hmm. and 16. Um, it says, An account that the long-suffering or the patience of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction so i think what you were getting at which is why i wanted to read uh the verse second peter three sixteen. uh in scripture i mean it says some things are hard to be understood um and i think it says it in the note as well underneath but we're not going to be able to understand everything no, no. but um, something that could be dangerous is what it says there. They that are unlearned and unstable rest. It means like you can twist it. You can, you can twist the scripture mm -hmm. the way that you want to. 
Um, and if you're doing that in the wrong ways, if you're interpreting in the wrong ways or twisting it to your way, not the way that it says in the Bible exactly, then it can cause your own destruction. So. Yes. And it says that it, I believe that it, everything that we need to know is revealed. Everything that we need to know is revealed. We might not know everything that we want to know, but everything that we need to know is revealed. Uh, imagine a father that's teaching their kids. If the father tells right away everything that he learned his entire life, the kids are not going to absorb it or to learn it or mm -hmm. to apply it. No way. Until they're grown up and they see things differently, they're going to be able to absorb a little bit more. Little bit more, little more. And they might finally understand what the father is saying years before. Mm -hmm. But if you dump all the light right away, if you dump all your knowledge right away, it won't do any good. Yeah, that's so, why, oh, sorry. I was going to say, that's why it's so important to have, like, just have faith first, you know, and then... What is the verse? Uh, faith coming through hearing? Yeah. Right? yeah. And the hearing through the Word of God. Hearing through the Word of God. So if you just have the faith first, then a lot of it is going to make, it's going to make a lot more sense to you if you're just yep. like, you have that faith and you truly believe. Um, and one of the things that can help us is also prophecy, right? Right at the, not the last quote, but the one before that on 4B. As we have fallen. Yes. You want to read that? Yeah. As we have followed down the chain of prophecy, revealed truth for our time has been clearly seen and explained. We are accountable for the privileges that we enjoy and for the light that shines upon our pathway. Yes. So as to prophecy, as we see things clearly aligned and revealed and explained, now we're accountable to those privileges. Now so. I can share with others. Now I need to make sure every other person knows as well. Mm -hmm. And God's will is for us to be sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. This is the will of God concerning you, even your sanctification. And now on Thursday, the final uh, section is trying to inspire us hope. Steadfast in hope. How mm -hmm. does Peter exhort us to to be vigilant or to vigilant in perseverance. Um, Peter kind of gives us uh, a warning. You can actually fall away. We don't realize that we can actually fall away. Second Peter 3, 17, See, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also being led away with the air of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. You can actually fall away. And it's easier really, than you think. Yeah, yeah, it's easier than you realize. I it's think. not as clear, it's not apparent. Mm -hmm. No, it's little by little. Uh, okay, yes. You deviate. It's not a jerk movement that you make in your life. It's small decisions that you make over in time. the wrong direction over time that can turn into big things. Yep. Mm. Usually we tell ourselves, oh, I'm not going to make that decision. I'm not going to fall away. No. Mm. It's just our little decisions. His children must follow where he has led the way at whatever sacrifice of ease or selfish indulgence. Right in the middle of the quote there on 5a. Mm -hmm. At whatever cost of labor or suffering, they must maintain a constant battle with self. Our battles are not necessarily with Satan. Our battles are with ourselves. For ourselves, yeah. That's really wicked, and we don't know. And in closing the epistle, what is the apostle's fine, final warning, final appeal? What is it that he tells us to do as we close this beautiful lesson? Does he tell us just, you know, stay stagnant, don't worry about it, it's going to be okay? Or what else does he say? In 2 Peter 3.18. Want me to read it? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so his final appeal, he says, But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful, encouraging final words. But grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And like I said in the beginning, so he's asking us to, Really, just to 
spend time with Jesus more and more every single day, to fall more and more in love with him, you know, every single day, and to desire to reflect his image and his character mm -hmm. perfectly and share his love with other people and to continually grow in grace every day through sanctification. Yes, th thank you for sharing. Yeah, there's no relationship that grows without communication. Mm. There's no way you can go closer to another person Isn't without communication. Mm -hmm. Same thing applies with God. We as Christians are not going to become better people or to be like God without spending time with Him. Your sins may be as the mountains before you, but you're, if you humble your heart and confess your sins, trusting in the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, He will forgive and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Desire the fullness of the grace of Christ. Let your heart be filled with an intense longing for His righteousness. The work of which God's word declares is peace and its effects quietness. Effect quietness and assurance forever. So may the Lord help us that as we progress in our Christian walk, that we may go up and to grow in grace and to stay firm to the end. So may the Lord help us that we may have that steadfastness, steadfastness and to be encouraged that, you know, we can actually make it happen sooner. We can actually speed up Christ's second coming. We can. It's, it's in our hands. It is. It's, it's in our decision to do it. So may the Lord help us to persevere. Amen? Amen. Let's close with a prayer. Our dear Holy Father, we... Thank you so much for everything you've given us. Thank you for these beautiful words of encouragement and power to, to help us to stand, stay firm to the end. Help us to be a light into this dark world. And forgive us if we haven't been that light. Thank you for being merciful towards us, even though we don't deserve it. And we ask to please build us as we go on with our lives, that we may be a shining light and be a banner uh, into this dark world. Be with, us, be with us during the rest of this day. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us as we study Lesson 13. Uh, please join us again next week as we study Lesson 1 in the fourth quarter, God's Message through James.